Hi everybody, this is Tim Chavez from Faith Matters. In this episode, we have a conversation with our friend Jerry Lee Renshaw about what it means to be on the edge of inside. In Richard Rohr's wonderful essay on this topic, he says that one who lives on the edge of inside is not an outsider throwing rocks, not a comfortable insider who defends the status quo, but one who lives precariously with two perspectives held tightly together. In referencing Martin Luther King Jr., Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Dorothy Day, and others, Rohr says, they tend to be, each in their own way, orthodox, conservative, intellectuals, believers, but that very authentic inner experience and membership allows them to utterly critique the systems that they are a part of. They critiqued Christianity by the very values they learned from Christianity. We're really grateful Jerry Lee came on the podcast to discuss this important topic with us and hope you enjoy the conversation. Jerry Lee, thank you so much for coming all the way down and visiting with us. We're, we feel like this is a really important conversation, so we're excited to talk to you. Um, so in 2016, David Brooks wrote an article called At the Edge of Inside, and the context was really not religious, but a lot of people in our faith tradi- tradition really resonated with this. And um, it's kind of resurfaced again for us recently, and we're working on this series about belonging. And we thought this is a really important part of the belonging conversation, that how do you find belonging when you find yourself at the edge of inside? And this is a space where where you've navigated really successfully for a while, and you're really helping other people to do that too. So we thought you are the, you're the person that we should have this conversation with. So thank you. Thank and, you, um, Aubrey and Tim, for inviting me. I'm yeah. happy to be here with you. Um, would you give us just a little introduction to your story and, and to who you are, and then also um, an introduction into what The Edge of Insight is for someone who hasn't read David Brooks's work or, or Richard Rohr's work on this idea. Um, what is The Edge of Insight? Okay, great. So just giving voice to a little bit of my lived experience um, and how things have played out for me so far. <laughs> um, I'll just tell a little bit about myself. I live in Alpine, Utah. I am ha- happily married to a wonderful man. I have four adult children and nine amazing grandchildren. That includes a set of identical twins, and I adore them all. <laughs> Um, Of our four adult children, only one of them is really still actively engaged in the church. So we've been um, on an interesting journey over the past eight or so years in our family. Um, I was born and raised in the church in a home that was pretty much ideal, where my mother and father led the family as equals. And I thought that was just the way it was. I didn't learn how unusual that was until I became an adult myself. For most of my adult life, I lived in a space where I accepted almost everything I was taught at home and by the church as absolute, capital T, truth. My husband and I have spent our lives in leadership positions. He was a bishop. I was a Relief Society president. Um, We were the kind of people who just felt like you should never really say no to a calling. And so we have been very, very busy in the church our whole lives. Um, And then about eight years ago, I had something placed on my path that changed the way I saw just about everything. Um, One of our children came to us in a very sincere and humble way, seeking um, counsel, I think was how it was put to us. And I realized that what was being shared was that um, he had experienced almost a near complete faith deconstruction. Mm -hmm. And I, I had no way of knowing how to understand it or validate it or you know I felt like I had spent my whole life in the church being taught about agency and when it came right down to it I didn't really know how to honor agency you know Yeah. yeah it was and it was painful like I didn't have any tools in my toolbox for honoring that um and life has a way of throwing you know things in our path that are on unexpected and difficult. Um, you wake up one morning and it seems like everything has changed and that's the way this felt. There is something new there that you can't get over, under, or around and you just mm. have to go through it. After a pretty intense period of reading and research myself because I wanted to try to understand what had happened, if it could happen to somebody as good that I knew to be as good as yeah. this person, it could happen to anybody, and I needed to. I needed to understand why. I had never heard the term faith crisis, mm-hmm. which some people use to describe what happens to them, and others don't feel like it was a crisis. I I don't describe that way, but I never heard the term before, and so I literally went online and Googled it, <laughs> and I found this world of people, and a podcast actually um, where someone in the same position as our child was talked about their experience, and I thought, wow, you know. 
there's there's other people that have experienced yeah. this and it just opened this whole new world to me i learned that many things about our doctrine and history that i i learned many things that i was not, had not been aware of i had not been taught them through our correlated um materials in Sunday school, in seminary, and those kind of things. And a lot of things really came as a surprise as mm-hmm. an adult woman with adult yeah. children, you know? Yeah. And um, so it was really, you know, I was kind of spinning, felt like the rug had been pulled out from under me a little bit. Um, we kind of tend to be what I would call a one-size-fits-all church. And mm-hmm. up until that point, that's the way I felt. You're kind of either in or you're out. Yeah. And you believe or you don't believe. And I assumed that everybody sitting on the pews with me was like me, just believed everything I had been taught, right? And so I now was like looking at things through a whole new lens. And it, you know, it's, it's a really interesting process and journey and there's lots of emotions. It's kind of like a roller coaster um, for anybody that experiences it. And so one of the most important things over the last eight years that I have learned is that we're not all experiencing faith and belief Mm. and Mormonism in the same way. We're just not, you know? And I had previously assumed that everybody was just kind of like me, you know? And really, there's all kinds of us out there. So do you want me to go right into my feelings about the edge of inside? So you mentioned David Brooks' New York Times article. And before I read that article, I read it when it came out, I, you know, I had heard lots of terms thrown around in some of the support groups and online communities that I was attached to, like a nuanced Mormon, I'm a middle way Mormon, Mm. and nothing really seemed to fit for me, you know, nothing really felt like, oh yeah, that's what I want to own, that describes who I am, until I read this article by David Brooks, and it's it's in the June uh, 2016, it was a New York Times op-ed in June of 2016, and he, like you mentioned, he borrows from Richard Rohr, and he talks about three types of people found in any organization. The first is the organization's insiders, the decision makers in the organization. So for us, it would be leadership, and maybe a bulk mm-hmm. of the people sitting in the pews in sacrament right. meeting also, you know, just fully believing. And there's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with that. They're an important part of the organization. Right. The second are the outsiders, the people who are maybe have never been a part of or are connected somehow or who have left or have mm-hmm. decided to leave. They are untouched by internal loyalties to the organization, and they can be the bomb throwers who heavily criticize the organization so you guys like me probably know people in both of those situations Mm -hmm. right and then the third are the people at the edge of inside and this is what really resonated to me they love the organization but while being loyal they also see the organization as imperfect and possibly even flawed Rohr says, quote, a doorkeeper must love both the inside and the outside of his or her her group and know how to move between those two loves. And that's really profound for me. Like I found myself in this place where, you know, I had this child who had had this completely different experience than I had, and I was trying to understand it. And even if I couldn't understand it, at least validate it. So I wasn't a part of causing more pain, right? right? And that's the hard thing. Like, We can't expect that everybody we communicate with is going to understand us. If they haven't experienced it, if they haven't walked in those shoes, they're likely not going to understand. But I have experienced many people who can validate that this experience is real and that it's hard. And just that validation is is just life-saving almost yeah. to me, you know? And yeah. um, and so I, I could see how painful this was for my child. I didn't want to add to that pain. And so um, and so I, I had this love for my church. I had raised in this ideal family, great mm-hmm. husband, great experiences raising our family in the church and serving in the church. But now I could see this other difficult side that I couldn't deny because it was a part of my family now. Yeah. Right. It was my family. Yeah. So anyway, so when I read the article, it was like a light bulb moment for me. It's so perfectly described where I find myself today. And I often refer to myself as living on the edge of inside to other people. Um, so it can bring up some interesting conversations. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so for me, I feel today and believe differently than I once did about the organization of the church. I find myself in the rather rather surprising position of the older I get, the less I know about much of anything. Mm -hmm. 
after years of having said I know and testifying and feeling like I really had all the answers, and if I didn't, the church certainly did, right? Mm -hmm. And I spoke with authority. And if, if one of the things I would like a redo on, if possible, is I'd like to go back and do that differently in raising my children. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't use those terms. I would maybe try to develop more uh, critical thinking from them and say, you know, when you mm. are taught this or when you hear this, how does this make you feel? I never listened to them. I just yeah. told them the way it was, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so I often reflect back now, having known what I know now, feeling what I know now, when I was raising my children, what would I do? Yeah. So yeah. that's an interesting, and you guys probably have experienced yeah, we that think, too. We think, we think about, about that a lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. yeah, and it comes up yeah. in discussions, you know, in support groups a lot. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I find this jury journey to be very fluid. Yeah. It would be hard for me to just say to you, if you ask me right now, this is what I believe and this is what I don't believe. Right. Because I'm not, I'm not thinking in terms of black and white anymore. It's yeah. like this whole... Uh, spectrum of color has opened up in the way I see the world and the church and my family and everybody yes. and th and there's just all these possibilities yeah. and I realize that I don't know it all and I need to m have an open heart and open mind and be willing to learn yeah I love that you know oh, that's great. with other people so um and I really was very black and white my whole life mm -hmm. yeah so Can I jump in really yes, quick please. I, I just love that what you mentioned about um the, the motivation is really this deep love of the inside and the outside. I think when, when you hear the phrase at the edge of inside, I think that if you if you haven't read any of the uh, any of their work before, you may assume that that means you're lukewarm, you know, right. or you're, you're maybe like sort of committed and you're not right. really sure what you, and maybe you're in or maybe you're out. And I, I love the way they explain that, that they're talking about people who are so deeply committed to the the organization that, they're, that they love and also to these people that they love and the issues that they love, um, that they they feel like are not being handled perfectly. I, I just think that's a that's a it's a different kind of edge. It's not it's not that you don't care. It's that you care so deeply that yeah. you have been pulled to this position of being a a bridge and a doorway and a and what was the other one? The, the three things that he says that you're you're just like this middle. You're in this middle ground <clears throat> where you you see both sides, and you may see it critically, but it's really motivated out of love, not out of a right. non commitment. So I'm so glad you brought that up. And my next line, actually, that I wanted to go into is this may sound uncomfortable or wishy-washy to some. Oh, so I was go. like, we were thinking on the same lines here. Yeah. But the other really important point that I want to make right here is people that find themselves in this space where they love the church and yet they see it differently yeah. are often the people who were the most committed to yeah. the church. So several years ago, I was yeah. involved in an online support group where the question was asked, how many of you people here have served in leadership positions? And the answers were blew me away, were overwhelming. These people who found themselves in this new, uncomfortable space yeah. um, had been stake presidents, Wow. Mission presidents, bishops, Relief Society presidents. They were the decision makers. State they had climate. been at that core. Oh, yes. Yeah. And their whole life had been devoted to the church. And so it's not that, you know, it's not that this happens to people who whose roots weren't deep enough or yeah. who really didn't have a testimony or hadn't put in the work. It's That's not my experience. And I've been in this wrestle with a lot of people for about eight years now. And really often it's the best of the best. Yeah. Mm that this happens to because we're so committed, you know? Right. Yeah. And it's probably why you feel, why it's so yeah. shaming, why you feel like you don't belong because, because you, I, I think you worry that people assume that you're doing this out of, out of, uh, you know, being wishy-washy. You're just, right. you're just not that committed and you're kind of becoming this, you're floating. Yeah. And, and I think they feel hypersensitive to that because it's, right. it's out of integrity. They're in that position out of this deep feeling of, of needing to be there. It's totally integrity, not, not right. the opposite, which it can look, which it, it can look like to someone who is on the deep inside. Right, and I understand that because having a child come to me and kind of questioning the things that were so dear to me yeah. was, you know, put me in a position of feeling like I needed to defend what my whole life had been, really. Yeah. You know, right? Yeah. Um, did you have something? Yeah, to I was, I, it's, <laughs> I've been thinking, especially I, I was struck by when you said the word uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable position mm -hmm. to be in. And one of the things that um, really struck me about the article as well from David Brooks is that he, I mean, obviously this 
dynamic, the inside, edge of inside and outside happens across all types of organizations. All types, you know? yes. And David Brooks actually primarily comes at it from like a political point of view. Right, he does. And, and he, he does. Uh, this is, I mean, this is 2016, obviously, and things have changed dramatically Dramatic. since then. But he has a couple of examples. So he says that Hillary Clinton is sort of the insider in the mm-hmm. Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. And from his perspective, at that point, um, Donald Trump was the outsider it's to the Republican best. Party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think in 2016 he was. Right. Um, and then he he points out Lindsey Graham as somebody that was on the edge of inside. I, I don't I don't think most people would that have followed the news would argue that maybe right. over the past right. 12 yeah. to 24 right. months. But um, I think a good example now is maybe like a, a Mitt Romney. And I'm not trying to make a political <laughs> statement here at all. But the discomfort that comes from being mm. on the edge of inside, I think, was on clear display if you watched his speech a, a couple of example. a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Like he obviously is very committed to mm-hmm. conservative, you know, conservative principles and the Republican mm-hmm. Party itself. Yeah. Um, and when he found himself sort of breaking ranks a little bit with uh, the rules, so to speak. Uh, that the Republican Party, I think, had implicitly set, you could see that that was, that was yeah. tearing him up inside. You it know, it was, was a place of deep, deep discomfort. And I think that analogy sort of holds in any of the, in any of the organizational dynamics that you find yourself in, political, religious, or mm-hmm. what have you. Yeah, and Mitt Romney, you know, whether you love him or you don't care for him at all, to me, that was just such a great display of owning his own moral authority, Mm -hmm. you know, not being swayed by what he was being told or pressured to, but this is me and I have to live with myself. And so this is what I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. That is such a, in religion, we all have to come to that. We all have to Mm -hmm. come to that point of learning to trust our heart and mind. I like to call it divine intuition, which Mm -hmm. I've heard Thomas McConkie, who was a recent guest of yours also refer to. And I think that's really important. You know, in Richard Rohr, in his um, book, Falling Upward, which is a fabulous read for anybody who hasn't read it, talks about, you know, the two parts of life and how, you know, we're taught the basics and and to be obedient and all those things in the first half of life. And then the second half of life, we kind of have to learn to be adults and live in Mm -hmm. our own skin and give ourselves permission to make decisions and decide and feel comfortable for for how we're, you know, moving forward in life. Right, right. Anyway. I got so a little off maybe, track can there, I, No, no, this is exactly what we wanted to talk about. I wanted to just add, we're in this um, part of the conversation where we talk about being totally committed. The other example that he, that both David Brooks and Richard Rowe bring up is um, Martin Luther King. And I just wanted to read this quote because I know I could never say it. And I, this, is, this is the one I think about all the time. He says um, that Martin Luther King had an authentic inner experience of what it meant to be American. This love allowed him to critique America from the values he learned from America. He could be utterly relentless in bringing America closer to herself precisely because his devotion to American ideals was so fervent. And then he goes on to explain that you have to expect that you will be criticized for that. That that and just like the Mitt Romney example, people don't don't clap their hands and, you know, pat you on the back. Like mm-hmm. you'll you'll be criticized. And and we've talked about Joseph Smith a little bit and that he he was kind of at the edge of, of a different circle. He was at the edge of of the Protestant inside and right. really pushed boundaries and and he lived that model to a T. He was he was criticized and mocked and pushed out farther. And and so I think that's where I would love to spend some time is when you're when you're sensing that, when you're feeling that you're you don't belong because you're at the edge of edge of inside. What do you do to find belonging on a Sunday or with your community on a regular day? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I can only share from my lived experience. And if you put 10 different people in my chair who've experienced what I have, they would probably tell you different things. So yeah. I also just wanted to say that I'm not in any way like trying to promote or encourage this path for anyone. Sure. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I want this to come across as... This is something I wasn't looking for that just Mm -hmm. showed up on my path one day. And since it affected my family, my eternal family, I invested myself in trying to get some kind of understanding about it, you know? And so it's where I am today. Um, I just want to go back for one second, if I could. Sure, yeah. Because I talked a lot about Mm -hmm. um, not knowing and, and even the idea of, truth, capital T, truth, is changed for me. And I think truth varies from one person to another because our perspectives are different. But Mm -hmm. I do want to make the point that I think faith plays in big time in this. Um, And so how I experience faith today, these are kind of my four bullet points on what faith is to me. Faith exists in possibilities, not certainties. Mm. 
Faith is what we choose to do in the absence of certainty. True faith is the ability to act in the presence of doubt. True faith is a recognition that we don't know. And so wow. just so that you kind of understand what happens, what has happened for me, my experience, that faith is really big. It's probably huge. And hope for me, mm-hmm. where I don't feel like I have to know. I've kind of let go of the idea of ever knowing, for sure, yeah. about some things. I'm okay with that. Yeah. It's actually kind of a peaceful place that I found, which is surprising after years of living black and white. I heard Claudia Bushman at a fireside that she and Richard presented at a few years ago say this, quote, ambiguity and contradiction are a part of life. Truth is elusive and malleable. Accepting that condition is a necessary part of maturity. And I loved that. She just was speaking right to me. So how do we, yeah. So, so how do we find a comfortable place in the church when our beliefs have changed what we know is different or we just don't know but we love the people and we love being there um that's the question that you want to go into right maybe and can i before you jump in let me just i i think a huge part of that battle is accepting that faith is not knowledge it's not right what you right. learned that's in why primary. i wanted to it's get that in there knowing the sun will rise yeah. it's yeah if, if you can accept that this isn't a deficiency that you are standing in this place and you don't know what's going to happen and that's faith i think right just just that new understanding gives you such a sense of longing right like I, so- this is not something i'm i lack i'm this is faith this is me showing faith by not having the answers and and choosing a path right and- yeah, I was just gonna say, and that's that's sort of the Brene Brown idea of belonging, right? Is that it's that internal yeah. mm-hmm. uh, cohesion that brings you brings you peace, and you sort of take that belonging with you wherever you go. But at the same time, like the pragmatic part of me is like, well, that sounds great, but when you show up to church on Sunday yeah. and your beliefs, you know, vary in some cases dramatically from what you have mm-hmm. all around you, mm-hmm. you may feel you may feel very confident on the inside, but there is something about that community dynamic and the personal interactions yeah. that you have one on one. If there is tension there, then it can it can just uh, sort of distort that that sense yeah. of belonging that you would prefer to have. Yeah, one that's one of the bittersweet aspects of Mormonism, I think, is that yeah. it permeates all of our relationships. Yeah. You know, with the and when the church is working for you, this can be a great source of joy. And when it isn't, yeah. it can be painful and isolating. So the one thing I would say is that it takes time. And sometimes people mm. find themselves either in faith crisis or just questioning things that they hadn't question before and it's an uncomfortable painful place to be Mm -hmm. and so one of the things that I had to learn is to get comfortable with being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. you know that I may be different than most of the people in this room I may see the world differently I may believe differently Um, I may not agree with a lot of things and that happens for many of us um, at Fast and Testimony Meeting, we couldn't yeah. and wouldn't get up and say that we absolutely know. And we don't often hear testimonies <clears throat> that are based on faith like I described it, right? right? I had a conversation with my friend who's a Relief Society president recently, and that was like a, a new idea for her, you know, that wow. we don't need to just say that we know but we can talk about what we hope for and what we have felt, you know? Right, and yeah. those are powerful. Yeah. Those are powerful experiences And what to we hear. want, yeah, yeah, really powerful. So yeah. I'd love to see us be able to, you know, move more into that. Um, but it is, it takes some time. And for people who know somebody and love somebody going through this experience, there can be a real anger phase that people mm-hmm. go through. People can feel... Uh, you know, that the church wasn't honest about things and that maybe they served a mission and testified of things that they now found, you know, are a little different than what they knew. And so sometimes people need to just work through the the wrestle of that. And any way that we can just validate, if all you can do is say, this sounds really hard, you know, and this looks like it's really painful for you and validate that person. A lot of times, you know, they'll kind of settle into a more comfortable place. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way I experienced it. Like for a while, I was just a little bit shell-shocked. I wasn't really angry, but I just was so unsure about Mm -hmm. everything that I thought I had been sure about. And it just took me some time before I could say, I can live with this. I don't really have to know some of these things. I don't have to say that I know. I think it's okay to say, I don't know, yeah. you know, I don't know, but this is what interests me about that. Right. Um, and then, you know, the other really big 
piece of the pie there is your local leadership is such right. such an important factor in how well you can stay engaged, you know? Right. And yeah. I've really experienced it both ways. Uh, several years ago, we were in a ward where it was very, very difficult, very difficult. And I just yeah. felt like I, I, I didn't say anything in church. I never would want to derail a teacher or disagree or whatever. But I had talked to a few people in the ward who, um, this was after the essays came out, mm -hmm. and I had talked about the essays that are on the church website, yeah. right, put out by the church. And then I started to get some feedback from different people in the ward that they understood I was reading some anti-Mormon material, oh. Oh. which couldn't have been further from the truth, right? But I just, I feel like, okay, I know that's not right, and so yeah. I'm not going to go out and argue my position, right? But it put me you in this that. tough position yeah. where I felt like I was really being judged mm -hmm. because... I was learning and looking into things from what I saw as a very safe source, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but, but there's a lot of fear in that for a lot of people. And so sometimes we have leaders that kind of lead with fear. And that's what I yeah. determined in this situation is there was so much fear of like losing people or people not having that strong I know testimony yeah. that they didn't know what to do with this, you know? And, right. I, and I would never put somebody in a position where I would say, you got to read this and you got to read this. And, yeah. you know, never, because I really believe in people having their own journey at their own time, you know? Right. I didn't go looking for it. Nobody forced it to me. I decided I needed to understand some of the things that had been yeah. difficult and caused dissonance for, you know, my own child. So yeah. um, right now I have really awesome ward leadership. So we made a move uh -huh. in the same stake. It's Utah, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, and I was greeted by a new bishop who I'm sure had communicated with the last bishop who was really worried about me. Right. Never talked to me about it, however. Okay. I only heard that from <laughs> other people. And I would have talked to him about it. But anyway, and um, and he just was so welcoming. He just said, mm -hmm. we are so lucky to have you here. Wow. And you know what? When you have felt like your leaders in your local you know, congregation don't understand you, that yeah. is an amazingly incredible thing to hear. Yes. And so then a new bishop that got put in about a year ago, you know, same thing. He just really honors wherever people are at. We have yeah. people in our neighborhood that are are not members of the church, either never members of the church or have made the decision to leave. And he works really hard at just being friends with them. It doesn't have anything to do with the church. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not about, I would really like to see you come back to church. It's not yeah. about that. Yeah. They just feel loved and accepted for who they are. Yeah. And in my little neighborhood, I feel like we have a really unusual um, situation there where people are just fabulous. And so yeah. that makes it a lot easier to right. be in my space, you yeah. know? Yeah. When I was extended a calling to be a Relief Society teacher, I was very open with the bishop and had already been open with the Relief Society president. I said, like, are you sure? You know, yeah. <laughs> are you sure? Like, I gave him every opportunity to back out. And he just said, no, we really want you. We really need you. And so not everybody experiences that kind right. of acceptance, you know? And I'm also very careful to tell people because this is a fluid journey, because it changes, and because I have heard so many stories about people being judged by fear, to be careful about who you share yeah. this very personal journey with. Make sure these are people in your circle of trust, you know? Yeah. And so I have the privilege of having that in my ward, but I've also experienced not having it. Yeah. And I know how hard that can be. So. I know and love a lot of people who have left the church, even yeah. in my own family. And I know and love a lot of people who are in my space mm -hmm. and are able to make it work. But there's a lot of different factors involved yeah. in that. It's complicated. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, the fact that you know and love people on, on both sides of that, I think it really does put you in a, in a privileged position it to does. be a, a bridge builder, right? Yeah. And help, the other, help one side understand the other uh, and vice versa. But I, I feel like to some extent what I heard in your in your stories was that like when you made some attempts maybe to build those bridges uh, explicitly in, in, in your ward and that wasn't uh, that wasn't readily accepted, that it was time to just sort of, I don't know, back off or quiet down yeah. and, and wait it out. Mm -hmm. Circle of or find yeah, a new yeah. circle is that yeah is that the solution because I mean I my personal bias like I'm not one to really speak up in church in the first right. place and so I actually right. really like hearing that I was like oh I don't have any responsibility to, to say anything <laughs> right. like right. I would much rather just just kind of sit there 
but do you do you think that is the right approach? And is it is it a weighted out? Because and I actually do very much believe in time as a as a powerful thing. Yes. Um, like it can you know, heal many wounds and change a dynamic in a way that we would never yeah. have expected. And so I actually I like I'm okay with that answer. But I'm curious if that's yeah. if that is what you're saying. I think a really great piece of advice for anybody who finds themselves in this kind of oh my goodness what's just happened to me um, is to not it's to go slowly, not mm. rush to make any big decisions today, tomorrow, yeah. a year from now. Give yourself yeah. time to get comfortable with the questions, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, f- having people that you know. So in this difficult situation in this ward, I did have a lot of friends mm. who, interestingly enough, had been brought to the journey through the experiences of their children as well. Wow. Our children were not all experiencing the same things, but they were brought to a position of, wow, I'm not so sure about that anymore because of maybe an LGBT child or yeah. something like that. And so I had good friends. So that was that was the comfort that I had, is yeah. that I had good friends. Like there was a group of us yeah. who really supported each other. But I meet people all the time who don't know one soul they can talk to about this. And wow. so, yeah. you know, there are a lot of support groups online, and some are more positive and constructive than other others. If anybody wants to reach out to me, I'd happy to help guide them. But, um, you know, having that mm-hmm. uh, safety of a space where you can bring legitimate questions and doubts and struggles to the table to talk about them in a safe place, because yeah. how many of us really feel like we can raise our hand in Sunday school? And even if I felt like I could, I don't want to bring doubts into other people, just like I said. You know, I have to be, right. I, I'm very careful about that because I really respect that the church yeah. tent has all these different people in it. So, yeah. did I answer that for you? Yes, I think thank that's you. so great. Yeah, I think that's so great. And I think that when you're in that really vulnerable position where it's all new and you really do just need to talk and it's yeah. about you, yeah. you know, it's not about. It's not about contributing to the lesson. It's just right. like, I am in so much pain and I need to talk about this. I think an online community seems like a place that is a really good place yeah. to start to find, maybe not even just to talk and to hear what other people are saying, but to find real friends. Like to, right. I mean, that's the gift of right. Facebook, right? Like you can, you yeah. can see that this person is your neighbor for sure. and go out to lunch and go out to yeah. dinner and make a for real sure. friend that you can, that can be that circle of trust while you heal so that then you can go back into your community. It makes me think of, um, the, I love Brene Brown's quote from The Gifts of Imperfection that that your level of belonging can never exceed your level of self-acceptance or yeah. something like that. And and I think when you're in that period of just like, you just feel so uncomfortable and it's so new and you aren't really settled yet, it helps to just have people that can let it be about you where you can just bounce ideas off yeah. each other and really confide yeah. in each other and talk so that when you go back to your community, you feel like you belong to yourself and you're yeah. not you're not sensing that everyone's judging you because you feel so uncomfortable in your own skin yeah. at that at that point. It really helps us to be comfortable where we're at. Two, two things, that you're not crazy. Other people are experiencing yes. this. And, yeah. and that you're not alone. You're yeah. not the only person on the planet who's experienced this. Yes. And when we know that you know we're not alone, that there's other people, mm-hmm. it just makes a world of difference. It just opens right. up a whole bunch of validation. Um, so there's yeah. a scripture that I want to talk about for a second. Sure. And um, it's Isaiah 52, 2. And I think of this as being about big tent Mormonism. So it says in verse 2, enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch Mm. forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Mm. Isn't that awesome? (laughs) Yes, I've never thought about that. When they stretched forth their curtain, it was moving them from a vertical to a horizontal position, allowing Mm. for a much greater area of shelter and refuge beneath the tent. And I especially love Mm. spare not. Yeah. Yeah. Spare not. Wow. It's beautiful. That's awesome. The tent should be stretched and lengthened without holding back. Changing to a horizontal focus also expands the view of everyone in the tent. Mm. So I often am in church and hear something that is problematic to me. And in those moments, if it's really bothering me, a lot of times I can just let it go. We're different people. We've had different experiences. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't agree, but that's important to them. But it also helps me to remember that not so long ago, I could have said or done the same thing. Yeah. That I have experienced this shift, you know, that's changed me. And I don't know, we, none of us know Mm -hmm. what might happen in the life of that person. Right. That might bring some kind of 
new way of thinking or believing into their lives, you know? And so, and that helps me to be able to give grace and yeah. cut a yes. lot of slack and yeah. just yeah. reminding that I haven't always been where I am now. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and we just have to honor the journeys of everybody. Yeah. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm really curious about, about that place that you find yourself in now. I mean, obviously there is for people that go through, you know, what we call a faith crisis. Uh, that is, that's very uncomfortable, you know, but right. there, like, like you said, at the end of the road, at least in, in, for you, it seems like there's been a, there's been a, a resolution to that in the sense that you you do feel at peace, even though it's not a it's not mm. a peace with certainty, but it is right. it's a peace with with uncertainty. But at the same time, that's brought you to a position relative to the organization that's different than you've ever been in. It's that exactly. that edge of inside position. I, I kind of want to just figure out if that really can be a sustain, uh, sustainable place because like I, I have a a personal experience where I posted something online a blog post. Um, about a year ago, where I really tried to, I really tried to walk a line and mm-hmm. and build a bridge and say like I understand this side, I understand this side, and within I want to say maybe I'm dra- uh, like dramatizing this a little bit, but like I within minutes of each other, I received infuriated messages from both mm-hmm. from both sides, you know, <clears throat> and like that was that's really hard. It's like what's the benefit of trying to build a bridge if nobody seems if nobody seems interested in, right. uh, you know, and in that type of perspective. And like, I look at Mitt Romney and the obvious discomfort that he's in again, to go back to that analogy. And I'm like, well, he's like, I can't imagine he's going to want to run for another term. Like he, that's an, that's <laughs> like, that's such an, yeah. A, yeah. An uncomfortable well, it puts place. him in a position of criticism. Exactly. Big time. exactly. He's a flip flopper, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so like, can you like, yes, you've got the inner peace. Like you, you are comfortable with who you are and what you believe, but relative to everything that's going on around you, is it really sustainable to stay on that edge of inside and be that gatekeeper for the, duration of your life or do you need to eventually find a more of a resting place that maybe drifts more back toward the middle or drifts to the outside that's a really good important question so just so that i understand when you say you got these two messages fast from the inside and from the outside that's exactly right yeah and so that's that's the difficult position that we find ourselves in at the edge of inside is that we are criticized by people that are all in orthodox believers however you want to put it Mm -hmm. haven't experienced what we've experienced and people who feel like they know all of this and how could you possibly stay? Yeah. How could you stay? That's not yes. showing integrity, right? And so we do get it from both sides. And in that sense, you know, being in the middle is a good description because we are trying yeah. to balance this. Um, and I'm sorry that happened to you. Oh, but, <laughs> you know, I think it's one of those things that we have to just recognize will happen. And the more we can tell and express people to people that we honor your experience, you know, mm-hmm. like I have very close friends who've completely left the church and and have some hurt, at least, feelings about what their experience was in the church, Mm -hmm. but they know that I love them and that I'm having my own little experience in my ward and my neighborhood. And really none of us know what five years from now might bring in our lives. And I wouldn't have guessed 10 years ago that I would be here talking about this with you today, Yeah, you know? And so it's that being open with our hearts and minds to what comes next, you know? And, and so, so my answer to your question is, some people can. Mm, mm-hmm. And I really think that there are lots of factors that play into that. And leadership is one. If people feel validated, wanted, welcomed, that's at such the heart of what we need as humans, to just yeah. feel accepted, to not feel like there's something wrong with us or we're yeah. broken or or we're different, you know? Yeah. Um, and Christ was so good at reaching out to those who are marginalized and bringing them into his yeah. circle yes. his followers you know he didn't just pat yeah. them on the head as he walked by like he brought them in yes. you know and so for some people i don't think they can stay mm-hmm. or they find themselves in a position where they can't stay yeah. um and then i know other people's people who have been in this space of not knowing for their whole life and they've just kind of found this comfortable place where they can go to church and participate, yeah. you know, in ways that they can. So I wish I had a one yeah. answer yeah. for you. But I think that's important mm-hmm. that all of us honor what individual decisions are, because yeah. I think for some people, it's just not, not possible. Yeah, you know, yeah, I think I think you're right. I'm I, I love that you brought up Christ and sort of the way that he, uh, he gathered people and validated them. And I'm curious if you, um, if you see Christ himself as being uh, sort of a, a figure that was on the edge of inside. 
Um, I, I think there's an argument to be made, possibly, and I'll let I you, do. you know, maybe make it that <laughs> that he was. I I'm uh, reminded too of a podcast that I listened to, the um, another name for everything with with Richard Rohr, where he talked about how Christ um, found himself, you know, when he's being being crucified, he was at uh, what he called the intersection of opposites. It's like the, the cross itself, you know, has the horizontal beam and the vertical beam, which are opposites. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he was sort of on the brink of, of heaven and earth as he was headed toward toward death. And so, and Richard Rohr's point was, when you are at that intersection of opposites, there's there's suffering there, you know. Mm-hmm. And in Christ's case, there was even crucifixion. But I'm, I'm curious what you see, or if you do see that in, in Christ, that, that oh, edge of insightness. I absolutely do. I absolutely do. And, you know, he didn't spend his time um, with the spiritual leaders of, you know, of his, of his area and the most knowledgeable and the most learned, I absolutely think Mm -hmm. he was a great example of that. Mm. And he was constantly bringing people in and drawing circles. Yeah. Yeah, Constantly. And I wonder, I was thinking when you were talking before that, I remember Richard Rohr talking about how the the edge is this liminal space. He says, you know, by definition, it's a thin space. It's just yeah. it's the edge. Yeah. But I wonder if it if if it's getting wider. You know, I I feel like this is becoming a position that so many people resonate with. I wonder if that makes it more sustainable. Just just accepting that it is a position. It's it's a place to be. And and maybe as that becomes um, just more common, it will be easier to feel like you can belong on the edge and and that. You're not on the edge because you got pushed out. You're on the edge because this is where this is where you choose to be, and and in a way, it's it's um, following this example of of our leaders, you know, and of of Christ as the ultimate example that that he chose to be on the fringes with these with people who were suffering and who who really did not feel like they belonged. That's such a that's such a good point, and I think we live in a time. I taught a release study lesson a couple months ago, and near the beginning of the lesson, I asked the question, "How many of you know and love somebody who's left the church?" And every hand went up in that room, you know, or or who has had some kind of a shift and just feels differently, right? So everyone's affected by it, and um, we we are getting more information because of the internet, because of the essays, people, and more and more people are being aware of those they love who have some kind of a shift and believe differently than they did. Yeah. So I think it will get better and easier. Yeah. And I think it's better today than it was eight years ago yeah. when our child first was going through it. You know, there's a lot yeah. more support out there. And so I do think it's possible, but I would never criticize somebody for their choice. That's where I would be right. so careful yeah. for their choice to step away. And maybe for a while. I mean, I've known people who have stepped away, taken a sabbatical, and then they come back. They kind of got through the emotion and the anger. But back to Christ, I wanted to share this one thought. Think of how he healed and befriended people from all different walks of life. The sick lepers who were looked down upon, the blind and afflicted, the tax collectors who were unpopular and detested, the sinners who were shunned, the widows and the women who Mm -hmm. were so limited by society at that time. And he welcomed them into his circle of disciples. Mm. Again and again, he widened the circle and broadened the tent of who is considered acceptable. As humans, we are tribal creatures. But when I think, what would Jesus do? I feel compelled to go against these instincts and reach out in love to others. Mm. Wow. So I think that's that's really the ultimate example, right? Yeah. I love that. In the Richard Rohr essay, he says that Jesus Christ refers to himself as as the gate, you know, and the gatekeeper or the gate goes Mm, goes both ways, ways. right? And he says that we always notice the in but never the out. And he says, Richard Rohr, this is a quote, there is a place and time for being outside or you never really understand and appreciate the inside. And I think even the Book of Mormon, Mm. Lehi teaches that, right? Like that we have to to understand both sides in in order to appreciate one or or the other. So I think that's that's really true. Yeah, it is. I love that. Um, Maybe I think this is a really good place to wrap up, but can I add just one more um, thing from David Brooks's article that maybe we can end with? He says, um, he says, now more than ever, we need people who have the courage to live on the edge of inside, who love their parties and organizations so much that they can critique them as a brother, operate, them, operate on them from the inside as a friend, and dauntlessly insist that they live up to their truest selves. 
And um, I, I just love that. I love that framework that, you know, that that's what, that's the point of living at the edge. That's the right. point of it. Right. It's, it takes courage and it, and you'll feel criticism. But, but if the point is that you're, you're insisting on this, on this organization living up to its truest self, then, then that's something that you can feel peaceful about and feel like you're still, you still belong. Yeah. So. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Beautiful. Shirley. That was Thank so you, great. Shirley. That was really Thanks helpful. For Thanks for we all could go your work. on for hours, couldn't we? Yes. Oh my gosh, we There's really could. so much yeah. to talk about here, but yeah. I really appreciate the good work that both of you are doing, your willingness to put your time into this, oh, and the thank you. Oh, thank Faith you. Matters Foundation, too, because... These tools are so helpful in so many people's lives, especially those who really don't have anybody to talk to, you know? Right. It's really a great resource for reaching out to so many people who need it. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. I hope both. so. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, as always, for listening, and a special thanks to Jared Lee for coming on. And to everybody who's left a positive review of our podcast or content on any platform, we really do appreciate it. We read each review and comment and are grateful for the encouragement and for helping get the word out about Faith Matters. We hope everybody is staying healthy and safe. And as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.